Side 5, Zone of Contention, by Piers Anthony. Continuing on page 145. Maybe you should stay with Chantour, who really needs you. The girl's mouth dropped open in surprise. Really? Really. You always know what he means to say, and that really helps him. Well, he says I help, so as not to hurt my childish feelings. But centaurs are way too smart to associate long with dull kids like me. Brianna seemed to be digesting an internal thought. Intelligence isn't always what you think. Ask him. Heather looked at Chantour. He nodded. Oh, Chantour, she cried. I'd love to stay with you. I know you'll never chomp me. The centaur looked at Brianna. I must speak again after all. I am grapefruit for. He became a huge grapefruit. Grateful, Heather cried joyously, perched on the top, for her insight. The centaur resumed his natural form. He spat out a grapefruit seed and shut his mouth firmly. Para moved on. I like your boat, Heather called after them. Para made a dip of appreciation without breaking stride. That centaur reminds me of someone. Pia remarked. Demoness Mitria, Justin replied. There was a swirl of smoke. Oh, no, Brianna muttered. The smoke formed a mouth. Did someone mention my name? It was an accident, Brianna said. The smoke coalesced into a lovely buxom form, bound by an elastic halter stretching almost to the snapping point. And you found the foul-footed boat. Para quivered with indignation. What kind of foot? Edsel asked quickly. Avis, feathered, game, bird, domestic. Fowl? Whatever, the demoness agreed crossly. The boat relaxed. I'm sure the children will love to ride in it, Mitria said. Thank you so much for offering. She fuzzed back into smoke. We didn't, Brianna started, but of course it was too late. The smoke formed into Demon Ted and Demonica. They were stuck for another round of babysitting. Maybe the two of them will one day grow up and marry each other, Pia muttered, and the stork will bring them children they have to babysit. Named Tedman and Monted, Brianna agreed, and there'll be no mundanes visiting who are foolish enough to do it. Whose menfolk are dazzled into volunteering, Pia said. They both laughed. Actually, the children aren't all that bad, and the dazzle ability of the menfolk makes them more readily handleable. For sure. Justin turned his head to exchange a glance with Edsel. The girls were having their bit of fun. They departed from the river at a slight angle so as to avoid the colored people. Soon they came to a boy who stood by the side of the path they were following, with his right thumb lifted. Same to you, jerk, Ted called. Shush. That's a mundane, Pia exclaimed, hitchhiking. We do have room for another passenger, Justin said. First things first, Pia cupped her hands and called to the boy. What's your name? Gabriel, the boy called back. So he's not one of the colored people, Pia said. He can ride with us. What's wrong with colored people, Monica asked. Nothing, Edsel said, forestalling trouble. The boat stopped, and the boy climbed in. Do you know a safe way to the snowy mountains? Pia asked him. Oh, sure. Right the way you're going now. But you don't want to go all the way there. They're cold. We'll chance it, Pia said, and resumed her private dialogue with Justin. She had tuned him out, as was her custom with folks she had no immediate interest in. So Edsel and Brianna took up the slack, lest the children do it. What are you doing in Zanth, Gabriel? Brianna asked. Because you're obviously mundane. I guess it does show, Gabriel said, abashed. I'd like to live in Zanth. I made a deal. I can visit Zanth for a week. I can stay here if I can find a family to adopt me or a girl to marry me. Otherwise, I must return forever to drear mundania. How old are you? Brianna asked. Fourteen. That's what I thought. You're younger than I am, and so you are still mired in the adult conspiracy. You can't marry a Zanth girl. 
I could marry one who is 18 or over, Gabriel said, if she wanted to, if she didn't break the conspiracy. Both children perked up, evidently intrigued by the prospect of breaking the adult conspiracy. But you already know all that stuff, don't you? Brianna asked. Sure, but in Zanth. I know, and you'd rather put up with that than go back to Mundania. Yeah. Do you think I have a chance? To find a girl? No. To find a family, maybe. Then Brianna brightened. Does it have to be any special kind of girl? I don't think so. How about a nymph? Gabriel smiled. I'd love a nymph, but she'd break the conspiracy in the first five seconds. The children squealed with laughter. Ted grabbed Monica, and she flung her hair around and kicked her feet up in a parody of a nymph. For sure, Brianna agreed ruefully. Bad idea. But maybe there'll be a family. Maybe, he agreed hopefully. There was a fairly sharp turn in the path. Para, traveling rapidly, was off-balanced by the extra weight, and his side scraped against a sad-looking tree. It emitted a sighing sound. What was that? Edsel asked as they moved on. A cypress tree, Justin called back. They sigh when pressed. Now they came to another person. It was a somewhat portly woman. Are you looking for a ride? Pia called. I'm looking for a lake, the woman replied. There's a lake on the river not far ahead, Gabriel said. How do you know? Edsel asked. Because I saw fire ants near a fire and earth ants near earth and air ants near air. I saw water ants here, so there must be water near. Edsel nodded. That works for me. Then get in and we'll take you there, Pia said to the woman. Para could use a swim. A swim, Ted cried, clapping his little hands. Monica's dress became a two-piece swimsuit. The woman climbed in and there were introductions. She turned out to be Alexandra. What's your talent? Brianna asked. I'm a were-dolphin. I've never heard of that. I think I'm the only one. I've been searching out stray lakes, hoping to find another of my kind, so far without success. Why do you want another of your kind? Gabriel asked. I'm lonely. I don't like swimming alone. But you don't need another of your kind just for company, Brianna said. I think I do. Who else would want to stay with someone who's half in and out of the water? I would, Gabriel said. Alexandra looked at him. You look young and wild. Surely you wouldn't want to settle down to a dull lakeside life. Life would never be dull in Zan. Not if we kept you company, Ted said. We're younger and wilder, Monica agreed. Ethel exchanged a glance with Brianna. Would you consider marrying a boy without violating the adult conspiracy? Alexandra considered. That depends on how good company he was. Why don't you talk with Gabriel here? Edsel suggested. The two half-demon children lost interest and peered out of the boat. I could be great company, I think, Gabriel said, if that meant I could stay in Zant. The two started a dialogue, sitting in the center of the boat. Edsel, as a matter of courtesy, tuned them out. There seem to be a number of interesting people in Zanth, he remarked to Brianna. Every person is interesting, when you get to know him, she said. I'd like to meet every person in Zanth, but there are too many. Surely so. What do you think we'll find at the mountains? Melting snow. I've wondered how there can be such a cold place in warm Zanth. Well, it's because the temperature drops with elevation. That's in Mundania. Here in Zanth, you can fly way above the mountains and not be cold. I've been up there, so there must be magic. He realized she was right. Zanth did not follow mundane rules. What kind of magic? Well, once I met two brothers. One could turn himself into ice. The other could turn anything else to ice. Maybe those brothers live in the mountains. Maybe so, he agreed. That seemed just crazy enough to suit this magic land. But you know, there seems to be an awful lot of fortunate coincidence in Xanth, like the way certain people meet. 
Without moving his head, he flicked his eyes in the direction of the youth and the woman in the center of the boat. For sure. I thought about that. I think maybe the land of Xanth is female, so she does nice things for her people. But the demon Xanth is male. Yes, mostly. Actually, demons are any gender they want to be. But the demon is not the land. The land is more like his daughter. Edsel nodded. Now that makes sense. Maybe that's why marriages last forever in Xanth. For sure. If you could arrange to stay in Xanth with Pia. I don't think so. We have obligations in Mundania, and these are borrowed bodies. But sometimes it rubs off on people. Doug and Kim are just as much together now as they ever were, and they don't spend much time in Xanth. Maybe they drank some love elixir. If that's magic, it shouldn't work in Mundania. She nodded. Maybe not. Still, it might be worth trying. If we pass Love Spring, you might save some of its elixir and try it on her. I hear that diluted love elixir and a finder spell can enable a person to find her true love. They came to the lake. Oh, wonderful, Alexander exclaimed. I'm so dry. She jumped out of the boat, ran to the water, and dived in. As she struck the water, her clothing disappeared, and her body became roughly fish-like. She had assumed her dolphin aspect. Gabriel ran after her. I love to swim, he said. But there might be sharks or serpents in that water, Brianna warned him. They won't bother me, he said, pausing at the edge to rip off his clothing. Not with a dolphin friend protecting me. He's got a point, Brianna said. You're not supposed to look, Edsel said, smiling. I meant, she paused. Oh, you're doing it again, you rogue. Para moved to the lake and into it without pause. Now there were three of them swimming, dolphin, boy, and boat. I turn, Ted said. He was now in trunks and Monica had a shower cap. No, wait, Brianna said sharply. To Edsel's surprise, they obeyed. There's a shark, Pia cried. She was especially nervous about them, since one had snapped at her hand. Then the sleek dolphin circled, intercepting the shark before it could reach the boy. The shark veered away. It knew better than to tangle with such a foe. Isn't she great? Gabriel called. What a creature. I think this is going to work out, Brianna said. Now you can swim, Brianna told the children. Even as she spoke, they were leaping off the side, making small cannonball splashes. But stay close to the boat. Para paddled joyfully around, then moved back toward land. A centaur stood there. Hello, Justin called as they walked out on land. Are you the centaur magician? I am, the centaur replied. My name is Rempel. My talent is to know the talents of others. I thought all centaurs had names with CH sounds, Edsel said. That is the custom, not the rule, Rempel said. We who are outside the norm do not necessarily follow it. Outside the norm? Conventional centaurs do not have magic talents, he said, let alone strong ones. They consider personal magic obscene, Brianna murmured. Something moved through the grass. What's a shark doing on land? Pia cried, alarmed. Rempel looked. Those are a variety of shark called skates he said. They are harmless to ordinary folk, unless stepped on. Now Edsel saw that the creatures were forming hoops and rolling along the ground. Skates? he asked. Roller skates. He should have guessed. The boat halted by some sweet-smelling rose bushes. The roses were all colors. Brianna had hauled the children in. Now she got out and went to smell a brown one, and suddenly floated into the air above it. There was a shrill of laughter from Ted and Monica. Beware, Rempel said. Those roses have the talent of levitating things their own color. Edsel went and caught Brianna's flailing arm. He drew her away from the rose, and she fell back to the ground. I'm getting in trouble, just like a mundane, she muttered. Maybe it's contagious, Edsel said. Brianna looked around. What's that? It doesn't look quite like a centaur. 
Edsel recognized the creature immediately, but decided not to speak. Rempel said, Indeed, it is not. That's Allie, short for B.B. Illusion, a chestnut copper mare, just visiting. When Brianna still looked blank, he said, A horse, a member of one of my ancestral species. Oh, Brianna said, embarrassed. Like a nightmare, only less magical. For sure, Edsel agreed. Rempel suddenly galloped to the edge of the lake. Away, away, he cried, splashing the water with his forehoofs. Edsel and Brianna walked across to see what was going on. There was only a rather blobby sea creature feeding on what looked like weeds at the edge. This is Hugh, Rempel said. He is a manatee. Sometimes the sharks come after him. Then I have to drive them off. Ah, Ted said. His sympathy was for the sharks. To save humanity, Edsel said. Precisely. Then the centaur paused thoughtfully, glancing at Edsel. He does that, Brianna said. At least it bypassed the children. Alexander and Gabriel emerged from the lake. She changed to clothed human form in one motion. Clothes seemed to be part of her magic. Thus she wasn't violating the adult conspiracy by showing him any panties. Gabriel had to clothe himself the ordinary way, but since Alexandra was of age, it didn't matter what she saw. They walked toward Edsel, Brianna, and Rempel. I'm going to have sore muscles, Gabriel said. I haven't swum like that in a long time. Rempel trotted a short distance to pick something from what looked like a pea plant. He brought it back and gave it to Gabriel. Try this. What is it? the boy asked doubtfully. A therapy. It is good for sore muscles. The children tittered. I thought it made you pee. Demon Ted, Brianna snapped, silencing the boy. It occurred to Ethel that someday she would make a good mother. She had the maternal reflexes. Gabriel popped it into his mouth. In a moment he smiled. The soreness is gone. Rempel shrugged. It is convenient to know the talents of things. I can show you a lilac bush if you wish. A person near it can't tell a lie. Or a ruler. That writing device takes control of the person who uses it. Why is it that you are out here in the wilderness? Edsel asked. Surely many folk would like to have you and your talent near. I prefer nature. Edsel nodded. I can appreciate that. He looked at Brianna. I suppose we had better be getting on if we want to reach the mountains today. If you plan to spend the night in the mountains, you will need much warmer clothing, Rempel said, unless your love keeps you very warm. Edsel realized that there was a natural confusion. Brianna and I are not a couple. Our significant others are the other two, he gestured toward the boat, where Justin and Pia were talking and looking around. I apologize, Rempel said. The compatibilities seemed otherwise. Opposites attract, Brianna said. So I'm attracted to Justin Tree. I'm young and he's old, she glanced around. And we are involuntary babysitters for these two half-demon children. For sure. Monica said, mimicking her. Do you have any advice on the best route to the mountains? Edsel asked. The path forks, Rempel said. You will want to take the right path to avoid mischief and find warmer clothing. For sure, Brianna agreed as the children tittered. Thank you. If you get on the wrong path, you will need both your talents, for there will be darkness and magic to be deflected. Thanks. Ethel said. They walked back to rejoin the others. This is a beautiful place, Pia said. Justin has been pointing out its novelties. For example, there is a chemist tree. They looked. The tree's fruit seemed to be in the form of colored fluids in little beakers. And a water chestnut tree, Pia said, indicating another. The nuts were in the shape of damp little chests. You are becoming a naturalist, Edsel remarked. I really am, she agreed. I never cared before I met Justin. 
He's teaching me so much. We have to get moving if we want to catch the mountains today, Brianna said. Her voice seemed just a trifle tight. Justin called to Gabriel and Alexandra. Do you wish to ride farther with us? No, thanks, Gabriel called back. We like it here. Maybe we'll get married, Alexandra agreed. Then the two of them dived back into the lake. It's definitely working out, Pia said, in the Zansley way. They got into the boat. The duck feet carried them along the path up the river. We need to take the... Edsel began. Oh, look, Pia cried. There's an adder. She reached for a nearby snake. Oh, great, Monica exclaimed. But that's poisonous, Edsel protested. Too late. Pia caught the snake and lifted it into the boat. Edsel looked desperately around for a stick, but there wasn't even a paddle. What's two plus two? Pia asked the snake as the children crowded close. The adder struck at the side of the boat. There was the sharp bong of a bell. Now there was a mark on the wood, the number four. Edsel relaxed. It was, after all, harmless. Pia lifted the adder and set it outside the boat. It slithered away. She glanced back at Edsel. What were you saying? Just that we should take the right path. Did we take the wrong one? Justin asked. There was a pitchfork back near where we saw the adder. A pitchfork? Edsel asked, concerned. From a pine needle tree, technically. The smallest needles make tuning forks. The middle ones make pitchforks for farmers to use. And the largest make forks in the road. They are all sizes of pitchforks, really. So a pine needle tree could make a fork in the road. Now he got the punish logic of it and they had passed right through that fork while distracted by the adder. Should he ask Para to go back and check that fork? An awful shape loomed behind them. Ha! it roared. It looked like a centaur, except that it had black horns, bat wings, red skin, and green stripes. What is that? Edsel asked, more than concerned. It's a demon centaur, Brianna said. This is mischief. She faced forward. Get moving, Para. We're in trouble. Great, Ted said. No, it isn't, Monica said. They choke children. The boat accelerated, but the centaur was in full gallop and still gaining. Ha! Ah! It repeated, just in case they hadn't heard the first time. I am Dyrock, scourge of mortals, and you are on my path. I think we took the wrong fork, Edsel said. For sure. Duck feet can't outrun that thing, but maybe if we can reach water. She looked desperately from side to side. Para, take that detour ahead. It leads toward the river. The boat slowed around the sharp turn and plunged into an offshoot path. The tree branches closed overhead, forming a canopy, making it seem like a hall. The demon centaur's hoof screeched to a halt. He did not follow them. You'll be sorry, he called. Oh, poo, Monica called back. Yeah, poop, Ted agreed. Now Edsel saw creatures standing between the trees that lined the hall. They had the lower portions of men and the upper portions of bulls. They looked ferocious, but they weren't moving. What are those? he asked. I think they're hall minotaurs, Brianna replied. They keep order in halls, but I hear that folks seldom like the order they keep. They don't seem to be doing anything, Edsel said. That's because we're going the way they want, she said darkly. They'll step in if we try to escape. Edsel glanced at the children. They looked nervous. That made him nervous. We can't get out of this? Rempel said we'd have to use our talents. Edsel concentrated. What was his talent? Ah, yes, to modify or deflect other talents. He hadn't tried to use it, but this must be the time. Brianna peered into the deepening gloom surrounding them as the foliage of the trees became thicker. Ethel remembered that she could see in blackness. Worse coming, she said tersely. Ugly folk. I wish I had a pair of binoculars. Ethel knew better than to guess. What are they? They help you see in the dark, twice as far. The boat slowed. The way ahead was being blocked. Don't stop, Brianna cried. Plow on through. 
Para tried, but hands were grabbing onto his sides. They were gnarly, warty hands. They belonged to people clinging to the boat, trying to climb in. Edsel reached for a hand, about to rip it off the boat. Don't touch them, Brianna said. They look poisonous. Who are you? Ted asked the horrendous male face as it drew up over the rim. E. coli, the face answered. Edsel didn't like the sound of that. Who are you? Monica asked a disreputable female face. Salmonella. The sound of that was no better. But could his talent help? Edsel leaned over E. coli. How did his talent work? Did he have to touch or speak? Then Coli heaved himself up and sprawled half in the boat. Edsel put both hands out to push him back, recoiling at the touch. The man turned green and lumpy and fell away. What had happened? Great, Ted said. You turned him into broccoli. Now Salmonella hauled herself into the boat. Edsel pushed her back. She turned into a sleek fish and fell away. Ella's a salmon, Monica said. So that was how his talent worked, in true Xanthian fashion. The dark path lay right under an innocent-looking tree, beyond which was open water and light. Don't go there, Justin called, and the boat veered to the side, crashing through brush. Why not? Edsel asked. It's a captivity tree. Oh, of course Justin knew his trees. Now the boat shot out of the gloom and splashed onto the water of the river. They had won through. That was fun, Ted said. Let's do it again. Isn't it about time for your nap? Brianna inquired. We don't take naps, Monica said. You do now, Brianna said. She unfolded one of the stored blankets and draped it over them. It was decorated with pictures of tires. Look out, Ted cried. She's making a bed. It's part of the adult conspiracy to subjugate children, Monica said, appalled. Then, to Edsel's surprise, the two children settled immediately into nap mode. What kind of blanket is that? he asked. It's a tire. It's a tire? A tire. It makes children tired. She shook her head. I must confess, at times the adult conspiracy is convenient. You mean... Naps really is part of it? As far as they know, Brianna smiled mysteriously. He realized that she, being underage, was not yet officially part of the conspiracy. She had been bluffing. Now that they were on the water, it seemed to be clear sailing. Edsel relaxed. That last session had demonstrated that Xanth was not necessarily benign. Say, we should check in, he said, remembering. Another day has passed. For sure. Brianna produced the ear and handed it over. Edsel Mundane here, he said into it. All is well for the moment. That's fine, Chlorine's voice returned. Same here. He returned the ear. I feel a bit guilty for that, but there's no point in worrying them. Oh, look! Siamese triplets, Brianna said, pointing to the shore. What? Then he saw them. Three identical cats. But they had not escaped cleanly. One of the monsters had poked a hole in the boat. Water was leaking in, forming bilge. Edsel looked for a cup or container to dip it out. The leak wasn't large, but it could not be ignored. Then a water creature swam toward them. It dived under the boat. Suddenly the leak stopped. It had been closed up or patched over, and now the hull was tight. The swimming creature must have done it. What was that thing? Edsel asked. A seal, of course, Brianna answered. A seal had sealed the boat. Of course. Now they made good progress upriver. Was there some reason we didn't travel on the river before? Edsel asked. Maybe Justin knows. Brianna lifted her voice and called to the front end of the boat. Why didn't we use the river before? The rapids, Justin called back. And the slows. Edsel worked it out. The rapids would be too fast for comfort, and the slows would be too slow. Everything made sense, in its fashion. But soon they had to return to the land, because a storm was coming. The clouds loomed massively. I don't like the look of this, Brianna said. She lifted the blanket, 
and the children woke up refreshed. Stay close. We'll have to take shelter. Storms can be uncomfortable, Edsel said, but it's only water. She shook her head. Every time you start seeming normal, you say something stupid. They pulled off the path, and Edsel and Justin lifted the boat and turned it over. The duck seat lay flat against the hull. They all got under that shelter. Just in time, for now the storm struck. Objects the size of footballs struck the ground with sickening thuds. Then one splatted against the boat. Part of the blob dribbled down to plop before Edsel's nose. It was gray and wrinkled. What kind of storm is this? He demanded. A brainstorm, silly, Brianna said. I hate them. He could understand why. Only in Xanth. Soon the storm passed. They got out, righted the boat, and resumed their travel toward the mountains. The grade steepened and the temperature dropped. They had to wrap blankets around them to stay warm because they had forgotten to get better clothing. Justin and Pia shared a blanket in front, and Ethel and Brianna shared one in back. The two children did not seem affected by the cold. I wonder whether we should change partners, Ethel murmured. No, I don't think you two men would want to share a blanket. But Brianna's brown face was serious. She was concerned. Pia was a mighty fetching figure of a woman. For what it's worth, he said, I know Pia. She goes for what she wants, and there's not a romantic bone in her body unless she chooses to put it there. She wants information, not Justin. And he's thrilled to a convert to the interest of trees, she agreed. I guess I don't have reason to be jealous. It's just my nature. Then she turned to him. Maybe they should be jealous of us. Uh. Tell me more about this in-between stage you call petting. Better, show me. Treacherous ground, partly because he did feel himself attracted to her. I think you already know enough. She laughed softly. Just teasing, Ed. Was she? He had no doubt of her loyalty to Justin, but she could be as single-minded as Pia about getting what she wanted. She wanted experience. Ah, uh, Ted's voice came. Aren't you going to even goose her like this? He reached under Monica's skirt. Eee! Monica screamed, sailing high into the air. Then they both dissolved into laughter. They must have rehearsed that little charade. Obviously, they did know something of the secrets of the adult conspiracy and thought they were hilarious. Edsel was abruptly glad for another reason that he had not done anything with Brianna, aside from her age and commitment to her fiancé. He had not realized how closely they were being watched. The boat rounded a turn in the trail, and there, suddenly, was the scene. The illusion picture, he exclaimed. This is it. This is the reality, Justin called back. They got out of the boat, each swathed in a blanket, and studied the situation. The mountains were indeed only half-clothed with snow, and their middle and lower reaches were still draining into the river. Obviously, there is a warming trend, Justin said. But what is causing it? There was a swirl of smoke, larger and more ominous than Metrius. It formed into a giant, diffuse demon. I am causing it, the demon announced proudly. Do you have a problem with that? Edsel hesitated. Caution seemed best. This could be an ugly customer. For sure, Brianna said. It's running out the valley. So much for caution. The demon swelled to a larger size, glowering down at her. And who are you, dirt face? Uh-oh. Brianna didn't like being put down. I'm Brianna of the Black Wave, the girl said boldly. And who the bleep are you, hot stuff? The demon swelled another size. I am the demon CO2, and I like warming air. I hate ice and snow. Then what in Xanth are you doing here by the snow mountains, airhead? Edsel opened his mouth to interject something, but nothing came to mind. He saw Justin and Pia similarly stymied. Brianna's mouth had been too quick for them. CO2 expanded another notch. You dare to question me, you burned-up urchin? I mean to abolish all cold air in Xanth, starting with the coldest. That is here. 
After all the snow and ice is gone, I will look for other ice to melt until the whole land is warm. We don't like that, Foghead, Brianna said. The demon swelled to yet more horrendous girth. And what do you propose to do about it, toasted Ganon? We propose to stop you, gas brain, she retorted. The demon CO2 opened his mouth until it was wider than his head. Ho, 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 he laughed. And how do you propose to do that? Now Brianna hesitated. I'm not sure, but we'll do it. And here is what I will do, CO2 said. I will blow you away, and if you ever return, I will treat you unkindly. You don't scare me, you quarter wit, Brianna said. Ah, uh, Brianna, Edsel murmured. But it was too late, as it usually was in such situations. CO2 bloated to gargantuan proportions, then aimed his big mouth at them and blew. The wind was horrendous. It picked them up and literally blew them away. They sailed heels overhead through the air. Ethel didn't have time either to be scared or to try to catch a naughty glimpse of one of the women. They landed some distance downriver, in the cold water, unhurt but shaken. Tara was inverted, his duck feet waggling frantically in the air. The supplies had gotten dumped or soaked. That was fun, Ted exclaimed. Let's do it again, Monica agreed. The adults shared a sigh as they helped right the boat and then dragged themselves out of the water. At least they had found out what was causing the problem of rising water. What they would be doing about it was a work still in progress. Eight. Good Magician. Pia shook herself off. She hated getting soaked in her clothing. She was shiveringly cold, and their blankets were also hopelessly wet, and dusk was closing. What a mess. Para, the duck-footed boat, was the only member of their party who seemed satisfied. He was resting on the water, untouched by the chill and undismayed by his dunking. He was evidently not the smartest of creatures, and liked being of service. Well, she had never been one to mope ineffectively. We need a fire, a tent, and food, she said. Then we can strip and dry our clothes while we eat in comfort. I can find some fireweed, Justin said. I can make a tent from the blankets, Edsel said. I can roust out some chocolate spiders, Brianna said, peering into the darkness. Spiders, Pia said, alarmed. The girl shot her a dark glance. You're a vegetarian? No, but... She realized that she was in danger of looking like a squeamish female. It was true. She was plenty squeamish about bugs and other noxious notions, but she didn't like admitting it. Maybe someone else would balk at eating spiders, and then she could safely do so, too. Okay, I'll make a hearth. We'll fetch wood, Demon Ted said. And perils, Demonica agreed. The children were getting helpful? Pia distrusted that. But maybe such chores were their idea of fun. The others scattered. Justin and Brianna disappeared into the darkness, while Edsel scouted around for sticks of wood suitable for ridge poles. He was good at things like that. He used a rock to pound forked sticks into the ground, put the ridge poles into the raised forks, then set about stretching the sodden blankets across them. The blankets would drip dry as time passed and should provide shelter. Pia used a stick to scrape a section of ground clear, then carried in stones to make a circular hearth. The effort warmed her, but not enough. Her teeth were still chattering. Ted brought in a number of dry sticks for the fire, and Pia thanked him. He stepped on his own toes and almost blushed. He didn't know how to handle thanks from an adult. Monica brought pillows. They were dry and promised to be useful for sitting on and for sleeping on later. Pia thanked her also, and she reacted much the way Ted had. They were not bad children, just active and sometimes impertinent. What was interesting was the way they brought these things. Each in turn held the locket they had found before and spoke to it. Out sticks, or out pillows, and the things had abruptly appeared before it. That was a most useful and capacious locket. Justin returned with the fireweed. 
This was dull green stuff. But when he laid it in the hearth and said, Fire, it burst into brightly colored flame. The light radiated out, blessedly warm. Then Brianna returned with an armful of dark brown leggy substance. It was hard to tell where she left off, and it began. Pia forced herself to look and smell. It was chocolate in the shape of spiders. Oh, she was glad she hadn't made a scene about that. Then one of the spider legs moved. Pia stifled a scream. Oops, I got a live one, Brianna said. She picked it up and carried it to the fringe of the glade. They slough off their old skins as they grow, and those are pure chocolate. But I wouldn't care to eat a live one. For sure, Pia agreed weakly. The two children tittered. She wasn't sure whether they were laughing at her imitation of Brianna or her alarm about the spiders. They sat around the fire and warmed, but their clothing remained clinging and clammy. The others did not look any more comfortable than Pia felt. She would have to take the initiative. Let me make sure I understand, she said, standing up. The adult conspiracy decrees that no child shall hear any bad words or see panties. Is that right? That is correct, Justin agreed. And no child shall be told or shown the secret of summoning storks. Correct, but he looked a little nervous, as if distrusting what she was leading up to. Well, none of us will be doing any of those things, Pia said. But we do need to clean and dry our clothing. So I am going to wash mine. She reached under her blouse and unfastened her bra. Then she drew blouse and bra off together. Naturally, both men stared at her bare upper torso. But no undergarment had been shown, so they did not freak out. Of course, she knew from her subterranean experience with Justin that bras alone did not do it, but she didn't care to speak of that. The children looked also, but immediately went back to eating chocolate. There was nothing interesting to see. Pia removed her shoes, then drew down her skirt and panties together. The eyeballs of the two men expanded by five percent, and their jaws dropped by a similar amount. But again, no undergarment had been exposed. There was no freakout, and the children remained bored. Now I shall do my laundry, Pia said, privately relieved. She hadn't been quite sure that she would get away with this, and wasn't sure of the penalty if the conspiracy stepped in. Then I shall retire to a tent, with Edsel to keep me warm. She carried her clothing to the bank of the river. There was a pause. Then she heard the reaction. For sure, no violation. And in a moment, Brianna joined her, carrying her own bundle of clothing. Then at last, the men, oddly most reticent, did the same. The children, being half-demon, formed their clothing from their own substance, so didn't need to wash it separately. There was a swirl of smoke. For a moment, Pia was afraid that their fire had spread out of control. But then a pair of eyes formed, and it coalesced into demon vor. He looked at the four adults, and his eyeballs, too, expanded a size as he surveyed the girls. But he made no comment. About time, Ted said. It's really boring here, Monica agreed. So I see, Vor replied. Tomorrow, Mitria will take you to visit Robata. Both children clapped their little hands in delight. Then Vor swept them up and puffed into swirling smoke. One swirl was white, another brown, and their shapes were oddly suggestive as they dissipated. Did you see his eyes? Brianna asked. One reflected a white nymph, the other a brown nymph. I wonder who those could have been, Pia said. Then they both laughed. The men came up behind them. If I heard correctly, Justin said, we shall not have to babysit the children tomorrow. That's a relief, Pia said. However, we have a small problem, he continued. We have just two tents, and while Edsel and Pia can share one for warmth. Time to stifle this. The conspiracy frowns on stork summoning when one of the parties is under 18, Pia said. But I don't believe it says anything about sharing warmth, does it? Uh, no, but... So until your clothing is dry, you had better stay close to Brianna. For warmth, after you both have suffered a chill. This is merely routine common sense. True, but... Pia turned a severe glance on him. You are not going to summon any stork, are you? Of course not, but... So there is no problem, is there? 
When he hesitated, she repeated, Is there? For sure not, Brianna said eagerly, and hauled him off to a tent. Ethel joined her in the other tent and closed off the ends. Sometimes I think I could get to like your style, he said, if I didn't already love you. Shut up and mourn me, she said, but she was pleased. Their tacit deal required her to make him deliriously happy for the night, and she knew exactly how to do that, and was doing it now. But sometimes she liked doing it better than other times. She appreciated his recognition of the way she had solved the problem of wet clothing. He spoiled it by only one comment. I wish I could win you back. We're not yet out of Zanth, she replied, hinting that his ploy was not yet lost. But it was a mere courtesy. She still intended to divorce him after this was over. Then she would see about studying mundane environmentalism. Justin was a continuing font of information and insight into all things natural. But the things here were mostly magical. She would need to learn the non-magic variants. Poor Justin, he said. He can't do this, and he wants to so much. Maybe I can educate him for she could say things to the man that Brianna could not. Because despite her sixteen-year-old body, she was not sixteen, and there was precious little the adult conspiracy had left to show her. Sixteen. She loved being physically sixteen again. The merest twitch of this body could make a man flip. She twitched. Edsel flipped. Ah, there was true power. He was completely unable to resist her. And, with the magic of this land, she could freak him out whenever she wanted to, just by putting on the right bit of clothing. He thought he was having his will of her, but she was having her will of him, making him perform with desperate enthusiasm, thinking every notion was his own. How little he knew. How little men ever knew. In due course, Ethel wore himself out, and she was able to relax. She had not thought to bring any mundane stork signal interrupters, but there were other ways, if she were unlucky, and it did guarantee Edsel's complete cooperation on the quest. She wondered idly what it would be like to seduce Justin. She could surely do it, if she chose, but it would not be ethical, and with her appreciation of the need to save the trees had come an appreciation of the rules of that game. Strictly hands off the companions. Anyway... Brianna was her friend. Still, it had been fun making both men stare. She did not merely love this. She actually reveled in this 16-year-old physique and wanted to show it off while she had it. Once she returned to Mundania, she would revert to her real body. That one was not as good. Her necessary consumption of sugar to counterbalance the insulin shots had led to some weight gain. If this body was a 10, that one was an 8 and descending. But maybe she would now have the stamina to do the dieting and exercise required to whip it back into shape, working around her condition. She slept, surprisingly comfortable on the pillows, in the warmth of the tent and Edsel's proximity. Their session had really heated him up, and that in turn warmed her. In the morning she disengaged from Edsel's too fond embrace and went out to recover her clothes. They were where she had left them, hanging on sticks by the gently blazing fire, and quite dry. Someone must have tended the fire during the night, for it was in good order. She put on her bra and panties, then reached for her skirt, and saw Justin. The man had evidently been out gathering more food, and come upon her unawares, and freaked out. He was fully dressed, standing frozen. Well, she knew how to handle that. Interesting that the sight of her underwear itself had not affected Justin when he tended the fire in the night. It was only such a peril on the body that did it, as was the case, to a lesser extent, in Mundania. Like soda and ice cream, it took a combination to do the trick. What would be the effect of panties on a dressmaker's mannequin? There had to be some special magic, because Etzel was also affected, as Brianna had demonstrated when she mooned both men with her black panties. Ethel had seen similar sights many times before, both from her and the steamy movies he liked. Yet in Xanth he had completely freaked out. So was it something in the air? 
She donned the rest of her clothing, then snapped her fingers. The man recovered. Hello, Justin, she said cheerfully, as if there had been no break. Hello, Pia, he answered, unaware of his time out. He set down the armful of pies and milkweed pods he had foraged. They would have a good breakfast. Did you sleep well? No need to go into the first half hour. Very well. And you? He fidgeted. I... I have never before been that close to a... a... Naked girl? Whatever, he agreed, halfway emulating Mitria. I very much admire and love Brianna, but I was so sorely tempted to... to... His diffidence was charming, but probably pointless. Let me ask you some things. If two people both know the content of the adult conspiracy and both wish to indulge in an aspect of its mystery, is there any reason they should not? She took one of his pies and began warming it over the fire. Well, that depends on their ages. If one... But does it? Doesn't the conspiracy govern what they may learn or say, rather than what they actually do? Why, surely it governs also what they do. I... Brianna mentioned a man called Ralph, who was supposed to guide her to the Isle of Women last year, who attempted to summon the stork with her. Why, yes, he agreed. I was with her at the time, in her mind. She kicked him into Para, who carried him hastily away. That was an ugly scene. Why did she have to fight him off? I mean, if the conspiracy is enforced in actions, why couldn't she have just lain there, and he would have been unable to violate it? the same way we are unable to say bad words in her presence, like bleep. Her pie was warm enough. She took a bite. He stared at her. I never thought of that. I don't know what would have happened. I do. She did need to fight him off, which means that aspect is not magically enforced. Some things can be done, but not spoken of, such as natural functions, which this happens to be. She couldn't identify the flavor of pie. What kind is this? Brownberry. Similar to blackberry, but less so, and with a mocha flavor. Then he returned to the other subject. But surely it must be enforced because... Because it is enforced in every other respect. Maybe you are right. In which case, you don't need to worry. Next time you are with her, don't hold back. The conspiracy will stop you. She decided that there was indeed a hint of chocolate and coffee flavor in the pie. He was clearly nonplussed. But suppose... Suppose it doesn't. Then it must be because it doesn't apply to two people who are knowledgeable and willing and who love each other. At least when both are at least sixteen. Doesn't that make sense? But I've always believed... I've always believed that magic doesn't exist, she said. Sometimes long-held beliefs are mistaken. I think the practical thing to do is to try a thing to see whether it works. She sucked on a milkweed pod, getting the fresh milk. Possibly you are correct, he said dubiously. Justin, you know an enormous amount about nature, but not much about romance. So don't take my word. Just let yourself be natural with her and see what happens. Whatever happens must be right. Isn't that so? Perhaps it is, he conceded. She had finished her pie. She was satisfied. She had set out to educate him and might have done Brianna a considerable favor in the process. It was quid pro quo. Pia was monopolizing Justin by day, so she was enhancing him for Brianna by night. The flap of a tent moved. Brianna emerged. Oh, I must have overslept, she said. It happens, Pia said, not deceived. The girl had been listening, and she was no fool. Justin would be in for the night of his long life tonight. Brianna had no clothing. She fetched hers and took it back into the tent. She emerged a moment later, dressed. Justin had been with her all night without clothing, but this was daylight. He seemed about ready to faint. And, of course, the girl had done it deliberately. She could have called for her clothing to be passed into the tent. No fool indeed. Then Edsel emerged from his tent. What, am I the last one up? He asked. Oh, the shame of it. 
He was too theatrical. He had been listening, too. Pia grabbed his clothing and tossed it to him before he could come out. The others ate, and then they took down the tents and put the blankets and pillows in the boat, together with the rest of the pies. They were ready to travel. But where should we go? Etzel asked. We know what the problem is, but not what to do about it. The good magician's castle, Brianna said. We'll ask him. He always has the answers. However, there may be a complication, Justin cautioned. For sure, Brianna agreed. It's a challenge to get in, and he charges a year's service or the equivalent for each answer. But he does deliver, Justin said. Pia considered. We can't do any year's service. We're here for only a few days. Perhaps, considering the importance of the mission, he will make an exception, Justin said. Also considering who else is involved in this exchange, Brianna said. She meant Nimby, the demon's aunt. Justin nodded. Pertinent thought. So let's go there, Pia said. Do you know the way? For sure. That's our job, to take you safely where you want to go. They got into the boat and it paddled off downstream. That was faster than the upstream trip had been. Soon they came to the slows and the rapids. They moved out onto the land. That was the nice thing about this boat. It wasn't limited. We had better check in, Etzel said. It's that time. For sure, Brianna gave him the ear. Etzel and Pia checking in, he said into it. Then he put it to his own ear to hear its reply. He looked surprised. Nimby and Chlorine didn't check in yet? Well, maybe they forgot. We'll check again later, he returned the ear. Do you think they're in trouble? Pia asked. Compassion doesn't know. There was no indication of trouble yesterday, so maybe they're just late. Maybe, she agreed, but this made her uneasy. Then the boat stumbled and stopped moving. They hastily piled out and Justin looked. You are missing some toes, he said, appalled. Tara bobbed, his way of nodding. But that's not supposed to happen, Brianna protested. His feet are magically protected. Justin looked around. No wonder, he said, advancing on a patch of milky white weeds. You walked over lack toes. It's extremely intolerant. Even a protective spell may not suffice to counter it. And if we had been walking, we'd be lacking toes too, Brianna said, shuddering. We must help Tara get his toes back. Especially considering that riding in the boat was an awful lot easier than walking. But Pia kept her mouth shut. It wasn't a worthy thought. Doesn't Zant have healing springs? Edsel asked. Yes, but none close by here, Justin said. However, I believe there is a quack doctor in the area. Pia started to laugh, then realized that he wasn't joking, so she stifled it. Tara's father was a quack, Edsel said. And his mother was a dreamboat, Brianna said. So a quack doctor should be fine. Perhaps we can get directions, Justin said. At that point, a young man came from the path ahead. He wore a loose shirt and saggy trousers. Pia was closest, so she hailed him. Hello, she smiled winningly. He paused. Young men tended to when she hailed them and smiled. I am Pia, and I would really like some information. I am Don. My talent is... Yes, of course. Do you know where the quack doctor is? Then she stopped to stare. For a young woman now stood where the man had been. She wore a shirt that was tight across the front and trousers that were tight across the back. Changing gender at will, she said. That's his story. I am Dot. You... you're the same person? Pia asked. She had seen some amazing things in Xanth, but nothing quite like this. The man reappeared, with the clothing losing its spots of tightness. His hair was tied back in a ponytail that could have applied to either gender. Yes, I do know where the quack doctor lives. That's her story. Right this way. He turned and his hips flared. He was becoming the woman again. History. Her story. Edsel murmured as they followed. I get it. I think. 
I guess she can see his story, and he can see hers, Brianna said. No battle of the sexes there. But it does give new meaning to the term gender bender, Edsel said. He would. They followed Dot, Don, along another path. Pia verified that the person's clothing did not change with the gender. It was a unisex outfit that filled out in different regions according to the body beneath it. Probably a tunic would have been better, because it was more naturally pliable. She wondered what it would be like if Don Dot wore no clothing. Edsel's eyes would inflate at the sight of the woman and deflate at the sight of the man. What kind of a romantic life would such a person have? They passed a handsome tree. Edsel was about to touch its trunk, but Justin stopped him. No, that's reverse wood. Edsel paused. Does that mean what it sounds like? Yes, Brianna said. Think of antimatter. Edsel abruptly stepped well back from the tree. Antimatter. Touch that and it's total destruction. Not that extreme, Justin said. But reverse wood is never to be taken for granted. It reverses magic, and you can seldom be sure what form that reversal will take. Dot looked back. I was delivered near that tree. I think it accounts for my talent. The first time I touched it, it reversed me from a boy to a girl, and the second time, the other way. After a while, it got so I could do it on my own, Don concluded. I don't want to touch it, Pia said. I'm satisfied as a girl. For sure, Brianna agreed. Reverse wood does not necessarily reverse gender, Justin said. It may have no effect on a person and merely reverse something a person touches it to. But I agree that we do not wish to experiment. I am surprised to discover it here. I had thought most such trees were destroyed some time ago. That reminds me, Don said. When I was really little, this tree was a rotting stump. Then it formed into a gnarly old tree. Now it's a mature tree, healthier. It is living backwards, Justin said. Reverse wood lives backwards. That makes perfect sense, though it had not occurred to me before. They moved on and soon came to a shack where a number of ducks flocked. An old man sat on a stool, bandaging a duck's sore foot. This was obviously the quack doctor. Someone to see you, Grandpa, Dot said. The man looked up. Hello. I'm Owen Cossaboon, quack doctor. What can I do for you? You're mundane, Brianna said. Yes, I have no magic. That's why I'm a quack. But I do what I can. He turned the bandaged duck loose. We have a patient for you, Pia said. She beckoned to Para, who had hung back. The boat limped up. Oh, you ran afoul of the lactose, Owen said sympathetically. I thought we had cleaned out that patch, but it must have grown back. Can you help? Pia hardly relished the notion of walking a long way instead of riding. No, but maybe my daughter can. He turned his head and called, Sharon! A woman in her mid-thirties emerged from the house. What? Oh, look at that boat. Para, Pia said. That's his name. He lost some toes. Has he eaten anything from around here? No, Brianna said. Para doesn't eat. Yes, I can help, Sharon said. She came and kneeled by the boat. She picked up an injured foot and massaged it, and its webbing extended. You're healing it, Pia said, surprised. Yes, but it's not much. I can heal only other folks' injuries, Sharon said. A few drops of healing elixir could do the same. She picked up another foot. It's enough, Pia said. She had seen a good deal of magic in Vance, but it still could surprise her. Soon all the duck feet were whole again. Thank you, Pia said, much relieved. What can we do for you folk in return? Owen glanced at her. We don't seek any return favors. Just being useful is enough. Just being in Xanth is enough. And that's one remarkable boat. Well, I'll give you something anyway, Pia said. 
She leaned down and kissed him on the ear. Owen blushed. That pleased her. It meant that she still had it, and it worked on strangers. While she would have bridled if anyone had called her insecure, she did appreciate evidence that she was as pretty as she had ever been. There was power in prettiness. Edsel fidgeted. Something was on his mind. Maybe I'm missing something, he said. But if Sharon can heal a duck's feet, why did you have to bandage that other duck? Owen glanced at his daughter. I can't heal local creatures, Sharon said. I think it's because of the ambience of the reverse wood tree. Any creature who has eaten something here is immune to my healing. But Dad helps them. It just takes more time. They got into the boat. Well, thanks again, Brianna said. We have to move on to the good magician's castle. You will have to get across the gap chasm, Owen said. That may be a problem, unless Para can sprout wings. Oops, I hadn't thought of that, Brianna said. But maybe we'll be able to find the invisible bridge. Invisible? Pia asked. Not at all sure she liked the sound of it. You'll see, Brianna said cheerfully. Or maybe won't see, as the case may be. They moved out. Pia had to admit it to herself. Zant was getting to her. She liked it, and she liked the people she was encountering here. It was Edsel who had made the deal to get her here, in the hope that it would change her mind about their marriage. She had deemed that a forlorn hope of his, but his chances no longer seemed quite as remote. If she could just keep her nice body. But of course, this wasn't really her body. It was a borrowed body, better than her own. They returned to the main path and headed south. Soon it fed into one of the enchanted paths, so that they could relax. They would be safe as long as they stayed on it. By about noon, they reached it. The gap chasm was an enormous cleft in the land, dropping awesomely far down. Pia felt a bit dizzy and ill peering down. The thought of crossing an invisible bridge hardly appealed. How would they know where the edge of it was? They ranged along the brink. The bridge isn't right by the path, Brianna said. This may be a long search. Pia was getting hungry. Is it safe to forage here? Perhaps I should accompany you, Justin said diplomatically. Fine. He was always such a gentleman that she wouldn't have minded his company, even if she wasn't trying to learn all about nature. They walked a bit away from the chasm. Those berries look good, Pia said. They are excellent, but not for eating, he said. Those are thimble berries, useful for sewing. He picked one, showing how it was hollow and thick over the tip of the finger. Then she saw what looked like pies growing, except that they had projections on the sides. How about those? Now that's interesting, he said. Those are the very first of that variety I have seen in Zanth. I know them only from a description. They are pie and ears. Note the ears on the sides. So that was what they were. Are they edible? Oh, yes, certainly. But best to stay with the ones with ears. Why? she asked, picking one without looking. Because when they have legs, they... She looked. A pair of legs hung down from the one she held. Suddenly the legs moved. Alarmed, she dropped it, and the pie ran away into the brush. They run away, she said, understanding. Yes, or... She was picking one with a smiley face on its surface. She lifted it to her opening mouth. The pie's eyes went round and its mouth formed an O of horror. She set it down. Point made. She picked one with ears. They might hear, but they didn't protest. The others came for pies of their own. Then they settled down to do a thorough search for the invisible bridge. But before they got far, there was a distraction. First, there was the sound, a raucous screeching. Then there was the smell, as of weak old garbage. Uh-oh, Brietta said. Perhaps it would be expedient to hide, Justin suggested. We are, after all, some distance from the enchanted path. What is it, a sick dragon? Pia asked. Worse, Brianna said. 
They hurried into the brush, but before they could get out of sight, the horror arrived. It was a flock of big, ungainly birds. No, not birds. They had human female anatomy. They were harpies, but not similar to handy harpy. These were foul of mouth and feather. Look, one screeched. Men! They flocked to gawk at Etzel and Justin. Pia realized that harpies, having very few males of their species, must be very hungry for male company. That was probably why Handy had been so nice to Justin. But these ones were so foul-mouthed and filthy that they would drive away most males of any species. Beware, Justin cried. We have found a nest of stingrays. You're bluffing, a harpy screeched. She hovered, evidently about to fly at him. Pia wasn't sure what the dirty bird would do when she reached him, but strongly suspected he wouldn't like it, any more than the average girl liked being sexually harassed by men. Perceive it for yourselves, Justin said, gesturing at a large, glowing hive. The harpies retreated. Evidently, this was an effective threat. What's a stingray? Pia asked, knowing that it would not be the same as the sea creature she knew of. A crossbreed between a bee and a sunray, he explained. They sting with laser beams, so can't be readily avoided. An aroused nest is a thing devoutly to be fled. He stood by the nest, holding a stick. Pia pictured a swarm of angry bees. These might well be worse. They would surely rout the harpies, but what would happen to the humans? She hoped the harpies did not call Justin's bluff. How could a bee and a sun ray interbreed? Etzel asked. Remarkable things occur at Love Springs. That must account for all the crossbreeds of Xanth. Pia made a mental note. Be wary of Love Springs. Then she thought of something else. You know, those harpies could be useful. Not in any way I know of, Brianna said. We need to cross the chasm and we can't find the bridge. They could carry the boat across. And us in it, Brianna agreed, catching on. But it would be one stinking trip. Pia glanced at the daunting crevasse. Maybe we could stand it for a while. Excellent point, Justin said. Then he called to the harpies. We would like to make a deal. Are you threatening us? A harpy screeched. By no means. We wish to cross the gap chasm, and we haven't found the bridge. Could you carry our boat and us across? Several harpies spun about to stare at the boat. We could. Why should we? What would you like in return? There was a brief hubbub. A million kisses. Justin was ready for that. My fiancé would object to that. Diplomatically phrased. The harpies could assume that it was jealousy. The dirty birds reconsidered. We are going to the Sir Cups, one screeched, but it moved and we can't find it. Justin smiled. As it happens, I know its schedule. I can tell you where it is this year. They distrusted this. This isn't the kind of thing you clean folk like. We have our cussing contests there. I am aware of that. It is where you and the goblin male settle who has the foulest mouth in Xanth. That's it, she screeched in agreement. The foulest mouth. Carry us across and I will direct you to it. No, you don't, the harpy screeched cannily. Tell us where first. Justin considered. It is not inordinately far from our destination. Carry us and I will show you where. Then you can set us down and we shall go our way. The harpies exchanged a dirty glance. John! The humans got into the boat and the harpies settled along its sides, their soiled talons taking hold. It was a good thing the wood didn't have nerves, Pia thought. The smell alone was bad enough. The creatures spread their dungy wings and heaved upward. The boat lurched into the air and out over the precipice. Pia fixed her eyes on the boat's floor, not wanting to see just how precarious their situation was. But after a while, she nerved herself to look. They were high over the depth of the chasm. Maybe the smell was numbing her wariness of heights, 
because she found she could handle the view. It looked clean and fresh. What's down there? she asked. The gap dragon, Justin said matter-of-factly. He eats most creatures he catches, and he catches most that venture into his domain. The gap dragon, Pierre repeated weakly. He took this for a request for more information. He's Stanley, a steamer. He breathes steam rather than fire or smoke. That cooks his meals before he chomps them. He has six legs and vestigial wings. He's Princess Ivy's pet. Her what? It's a long story. Briefly, he was euthanized when they met, and they became friends. Is that euphemized or euthanized? Euthanized or euthened. Made younger because of an overdose of youth elixir. He was a baby dragon. So they grew up together. It's one of the better friendships of Xanth. She won't eat anyone she asks him not to. This princess sounds like quite a girl. Oh, she's a woman now, with triplet daughters. There was a jolting crash, as if they had struck a barrier. Pia clutched the seat, gazing wildly about, and seeing nothing. What happened? We hit a wall, a harpy screeched. In the air? Pia demanded. A wall of air. We're trying to fly around it. I know a couple called Waller and Wallet, Justin said. They build walls, and their daughter Walnut makes wallpaper, but I hardly think they would be working up here. There was another crash on the other side. Several feathers flew. Another wall, a harpy screeched indignantly. Now I think I know what it is, Justin said. It's an air compressor. The walls of air squeeze things between them and drop them into the gap. Now he tells us, a harpy screeched. What can we do? Drop down as if squeezed out, Justin suggested, then fly again when free of it. Dead stick landing, a harpy screeched. Suddenly they all folded their grimy wings, and they and the boat plummeted. Pia felt as if she were floating, and she hated it. Not too far, Justin cried. Spread wings, a harpy screeched. Together they spread their wings. Suddenly the boat was breaking. Pia's stomach sagged down toward her feet. But it was better than crashing. Forward, another harpy screeched. The boat surged ahead. Pia waited anxiously for another crash, but it didn't happen. They must have dropped free of the air compressor. She pried open an eye and almost wished she hadn't. They were flying toward a nearly vertical cliff. It was the far wall of the gap. They had descended into the chasm. The wind of the harpy's wings dislodged a small object rolling along the brink. It dropped down into the boat and danced about as if hyperactive. It looked like a small tin can. What's this? Pia asked for the moment distracted from the menace of the looming cliff face. Brianna looked. Oh, that's a teenage can. A what? You know, a canteen. Throw it back. Oh. Then the boat lifted, clearing the edge. They were out and back over normal land. Pia picked up the little can and tossed it to the nearby ground. She was relieved to be across the chasm. Where? A harpy screeched. South. Justin said. Go toward the good magician's castle. Just how good is this magician? Pia asked. Justin smiled. He is not a magician in the sense you may believe. He is called good as contrasted to evil. He's the magician of information. He has a big book of answers that can answer any question. Well, I hope he can answer ours. One problem is that his answers are not necessarily intelligible at first. They are always correct, but sometimes the recipient does not understand until his adventure is over. And for that they pay a year's service? After struggling to get into the castle, he agreed. Why does he make it so difficult? It is his way of discouraging frivolous inquiries. He prefers not to be bothered. Maybe we're wasting our time going there. No, I suspect it is the only way. Ordinary mortals are unable to deal with a surly demon. She remembered the demon CO2 and had to agree. And there is the castle, Justin said, pointing ahead. Then to the harpies. 
Just south of here, you will see the burnt foliage of the swearing-in ceremony at any moment. Sure enough, a blighted section of forest appeared below. The harpies descended. How can they cuss so villainously when our bad words get bleeped? Pia asked. They are largely immune to the adult conspiracy, Justin said. In any event, they are all adults, so have no reasonable limits. But I'm an adult, and I can't say bleep. You have the body of a 16-year-old girl, which may affect you, and you are in the presence of a true 16-year-old, so can't speak with complete freedom. Pia nodded. She had been speaking rhetorically, having already caught on to this particular idiocy. It made a certain nonsensical sense, but she still preferred to argue the case. But I've been telling you how to test the limits of the conspiracy. Why am I not stopped from doing that? The conspiracy is very literal. To a considerable degree, words are more important than actions, so there are things you can do but not speak. He was echoing what she had told him that morning, perhaps having forgotten in his distraction. So she argued the opposite case. That's ludicrous. Actions have to be more important than words. Brianna shares your sentiment. She feels that the adult conspiracy is a vestige of idiotic, misguided, censorious foolishness. But it has the staying power of almost universal acceptance, so can't be ignored. For sure, she said, smiling. He had now almost openly questioned the validity of the conspiracy. Brianna would follow that up with a vengeance. Tonight. The harpies landed. The boat bumped on the ground. Hey, chumps, one screeched. You are indubitably welcome, fair creatures, Justin called back as they took off. Do they understand irony? Pia asked. If they don't, they will be truly annoyed, because beauty is no compliment to a normal harpy. But they did help us, Edsel said, and they're not bad birds. They could have dropped us when we had that trouble over the gap chasm. Pia hadn't thought of that. Not bad birds, she agreed weakly. Para knew the way and was heading north toward the nearby castle. I guess it will be up to me to get into that castle, Pia said, since it's my quest. It is true that Brianna and I are otherwise engaged as your companions and have already been there, Justin agreed. In fact, that is where we first met. He rolled his eyes reflectively. What a dear girl. What kind of challenges did you face? Mayor Imbri put us together, my mind joining hers in her body, and we tackled them together. We used parallax to locate the castle itself, as it was concealed by illusion. Then we navigated a sticky situation, answered some awkward questions, and rescued Mayor Imbri from a dream catcher. The main challenge was figuring out the actual nature of the challenges we were encountering. But I gather they won't be the same challenges this time. That is true. There are always three of different natures tailored to the querent. Querent? The person or persons seeking an answer to a question. Querent, she agreed. Since I'm mundane, just about any magic thing will be a considerable challenge to me. Will I be able to get through? They are crafted to be possible to pass, but they are never easy. Wits rather than power seem to be the operative factor. End of side five seem to be the operative factor. End of side five seem to be the operative factor. End of side five seem to be the operative factor. End of side five. Seem to be the operative factor. End of side five.